Welcome back to the program. We're taking a look at the difficulties that women face in the workforce in the United States and around the world. Some of the major issues facing women in the West are the gender pay gap, lack of paid maternity leave, and sexism in the workplace. To discuss all of this, I'm joined in the studio by Elizabeth Weingarten, the Associate Director of the Global Gender Parity Initiative, and from New York is Jacqueline Newman, a lawyer who works for Women's Legal Rights. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Jacqueline, let me start with you. Let's talk about sexism in the workplace. According to a report in Forbes magazine, when it comes to workplace sexism, millennial women suffer most. Millennial women of course, being defined as women who were born in the 70s, depending on which definition you look at. So here we have a situation where we've made progress on some social issues, like, say, gay rights, but when it comes to the gender gap, it's getting bigger. I think what's going on is that a lot of women in this age range are in a situation where they're having children um, and they're kind of in a position of deciding whether they want to be staying at home or whether they want to be working. And the concern they have with staying home um, is that, you know, there's financial concerns. And the problem is that there also is concern that if they go back to work, they're scared. I mean, if they have maternity and then ultimately uh, go back to work, that they're not going to be in a situation to be able to be promoted and move forward and be taken seriously because they have children at home. Elizabeth, when it comes to sexism in the workplace, we have what's, I guess, called blatant sexism, and then we have subtle sexism. Uh, in your work, what have you come across? Yeah, I think it's interesting because uh, you do see a lot of um, covert sexism these days. So what you'll see is women in meetings being interrupted or not their ideas not being taken as seriously. Um, you also see sometimes men, the term mansplaining has become popular um, to describe kind of the condescending tactics that men use um, to kind of put down women's ideas uh, also in, in meetings. So I think um, uh, women feel as though Perhaps they do have a seat at the table, but their ideas still aren't being taken as seriously as men. Right, Jacqueline, have we also come across a situation where uh, women who are negotiating a pay rise or a promotion uh, still find it very tricky terrain to traverse? Uh, in a, if a woman pushes very hard uh, for a pay rise or she feels that she deserves a promotion, she'll be seen as being too assertive, too pushy. Yeah, I think that that does exist. I think women by nature are not as good in negotiating in most situations based on the fact of they're concerned about being looked at exactly as you were saying as being too aggressive you know they look at that as being a negative meanwhile men in the workforce being aggressive is a positive so i think women do have a problem coming and asking for more money and feeling like you know that they don't deserve it which is a problem that we need to be addressing right and is there any evidence jacqueline to show that employers recognize this is a problem and are addressing it making it easier for women to have these kind of negotiations? I think that the more women bosses that are out there and the more women employers, um, I think that that does make it easier. I don't know of evidence that's actually been submitted that really addresses this specifically. I think that women are just being told to kind of lean in, as it's as been said by uh, Ms. Amburn, and to really kind of recognize that you do deserve to be paid and you do deserve to be recognized in the fact of what you do. So I think there's just a lot of encouragement that's been out there for women, and hopefully employers are hearing that. Elizabeth, according to the World Economic Forum, there isn't a single country in the world where there is equal pay for men and for women. I mean, this inequality still persists. It's really unbelievable. I mean, you have a situation where um, it's, it's uh, you, you, you can't... Um, I think one of the most interesting things about the, the fact that it persists everywhere, even in Scandinavian countries, so you have you know, places like Denmark and Norway, which have incredible policies for women and for families, and yet women are still being paid uh, at, at, at lower levels than men. Uh, but one of the most interesting things that I've seen that could be you know, a potential solution, along with other things, is to make pay more transparent. So you see companies across the U.S. and some companies around the world um, starting to uh, post their their um, salaries for all of their employees. So that makes this negotiation factor um, a little bit easier for women because they actually know, well, my male counterpart is in fact making more than I am. Um, so that's one way, I think, to, to get around this. But it really is striking that, that it, there is no place around the world um, that, that has solved this problem yet. Yeah, what you say, of course, we have seen on some websites which publish, well, not exactly the salaries that a person's earning, but the categories in which they work.
and what those salary scales are. Jacqueline, uh, that World Economic Forum report also has a timeline for closing this gender gap. It says 81 years. I mean, we're talking almost the next century here. Wow, I, I didn't read that and I didn't know that, but that is very, very scary. And, you know, I would like to think that it's going to be much shorter than that. Elizabeth, you know, when you talk about uh, equal pay for equal work among men and women, you've worked in Israel. Uh, and that is one of the few countries in the world uh, where there are equal opportunities for women, women yet at the same time, uh, looking at some figures here, women still make only 47% of what a man earns in Israel. What has been your experience working in Israel when you see how women are treated in the workplace? Well, I've actually, I haven't technically been a part of the workforce in Israel. I do, I have a small business um, where I um, source jewelry from low-income women in Israel. So I did set up a business um, uh, and, and worked for a bit there to get it started. But I can't say that I've been a part of the formal workforce there. Um, but but I, my sense is that um, the issues in Israel are um, similar to that of the United States, but you do have the compounding factor of, um, of military experience. So um, all, uh, all women and men have to serve their country in the military in Israel, um, and yet still uh, women cannot serve um, in certain combat positions. And as a result, uh, there's this kind of old boys club that forms. And so you have a situation where men who've served together in these combat positions in the military are then going on to serve in the private sector, um, and they start to promote men that are that they've that they served with so that's a huge issue for for people in Israel and I think for other countries in which conscription uh, is common and, um, and and you have this kind of promotion of, of men in this in these kind of dark paneled rooms so to say right so the attitude persists from the military back into the uh, exactly the private workforce uh, Jacqueline in the US among full-time workers in 2013 I'm gonna throw another figure at you right now uh, women made 78%, that's an average of what men were paid, and that pay gap has barely moved over the past decade. Why is that the case? I mean, with all these protections in the U.S. as well. Well, I think that, you know, I, I read something similar to that, and what they did is they actually looked at non-mothers, and they said that the pay gap among non-mothers is an 82%, um, which obviously is still of issue. And I think really what this comes down to is uh, some employers, they get nervous when they hire women that they're going to have to pay for maternity leave, so they probably factor that into whatever amount that they want to pay. And I think this is something that is being paid attention to. I think that people are moving forward on it. Should they move forward faster and should more be done? Absolutely. But I think it is being recognized, and, and people are making steps. One other issue, Elizabeth, and that is there's also a pay gap, a bigger pay gap, it would seem, when it comes to women of color. So the women of color actually have to... Uh, deal with two challenges here. One, they're women. Two, they're women of color. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that you see that um, particularly, too, in the, in the STEM industry. So um, you see women dealing with, um, or the STEM industry itself, dealing with problems in terms of um, a, a gender gap and um, a, a gap in terms of diversity more broadly. So I do think that um, when you're a woman in particular, being a woman of color, um, that those issues are compounded. Um, and I also think that if you look at um, a lot of the um, women who are low income in the U.S., um, particularly women who are trying to uh, survive on working several different jobs. Um, those are jobs where um, they are likely not getting benefits. So that's, uh, and that's another group that tends to be um, uh, comprised of uh, mostly minorities. So, Jacqueline, just to uh, come back to the point that you raised about maternity leave for women in the United States, um, is there any legislation in Congress right now to address that issue, that women be given a certain amount of time. I mean, the uh, International Labor Organization has set a standard 14 weeks. The United States doesn't observe that standard. There's normally 12 weeks given to a woman. Right. Uh, is there anything in the pipeline? Well, I, I, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, I know that right now, you know, one of the things about the United States is that we don't have paid, mandatory paid maternity leave, and that is a really big problem. And that's one of the things that I know has been complained about and one of the things that I believe that they are taking steps to address. Um, and even, I think I read a stat, a stat that said that 42% of the people don't even actually fall under the Family Medical Leave Act because you usually have to be 50 employees or more, and you have to have worked for a year, and all of these different criteria, and you have to be full-time. And so there's a lot of people that don't even qualify for the 12 weeks of unpaid leave. And a lot of people can't afford to take unpaid leave. So it's an issue. It's something that I do believe is being addressed, but I'm not sure specifically what um, has been submitted to Congress. All right, Elizabeth, we have a situation here where the International Labor Organization that I just cited uh, tells us that the United States joins New Guinea 
as the only two countries out of 170 that provide no cash benefits, as uh, Jacqueline has been pointing out to us uh, during maternity leave. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. Um, I think it's I think it's Papua New Guinea and Suriname are and and the United States are the only countries in the world. I mean, if you just think, you know. Think about that for a second. Um, uh, there's really no excuse for it um, in the 21st century to to not be providing some kind of um, uh, parental leave benefits. Um, I mean, and there's a business case for it too, right? So if you're an employer and you're offering um, some kind of parental leave, your employees are more likely to come back after that parental leave, and uh, they're more likely to be more productive. Uh, so you're you're looking at a, a a case for business owners that is that is kind of ironclad and it's it's confusing as to why they wouldn't start to implement more policies like this right and Jacqueline looking at some of the other conditions that the International Labour Organization uh, has recommended as a standard uh, is you know women should receive at least 14 weeks off they say they should be reimbursed at least two-thirds of their previous earnings and the benefits should be paid almost entirely through the state through Social Security or through public funds uh, the US is the only developed country that doesn't meet any of those standards. I know. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, and it is one of the, as I said, it's something that I believe that is being, you know, complained about. It's something that they're looking into. And I, I agree, um, you know, with what Elizabeth is saying, that this it's, it's absolutely unbelievable that the United States is one of the wealthier countries that exist. The fact that we are not paying people when they're having our children, it's, it's incredible. You want to say something? Oh, I just think that, you know, in President Obama's State of the Union address, uh, all of these issues were addressed and it was um, one of the more kind of compelling cases for a lot of these policies that I've seen um, and it does seem like there is some momentum so I think um, when you talk about the passage of the child care, child care um, development block grant uh, last year which had bipartisan support that's an example of you know potentially seeing a, a couple of years here where we may see um, bipartisan legislation coming through on some of these issues uh, because it does seem like there a tremendous kind of uh, um, uh, popular support. So we will have to wait and see what comes out of Congress, I guess. Elizabeth Weingarten, Jacqueline Ewan, thanks to both of you for joining us. That is all we have time for. But the conversation continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any show or chat with us on Twitter at CCTV America. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.